we worship you today. We love your presence. We love you, Jesus. Lord, we love the anointing and presence of your Holy Spirit. We love your word, your truth. God, we just love you today. That's your first commandment, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, we thank you, God, for your grace that you enable us to see God, what it means to love you, what it means to obey you, what it means to walk with you. Father, I pray today if anyone is walking in darkness, that their eyes will be opened. Father, we pray, God, that the spirit of pride would be broken. We pray that you would touch and convict every Christian and every non-Christian that's listening here today or listening today about this sin of pride. Because, Lord, we want to be humble Lord, you said you give grace to the humble. We know you give your Holy Spirit to the humble. So, Lord, help us to understand the difference between humility and pride today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We welcome you this morning. Everyone, Fire and Grace Church, those listening by Blog Talk Radio, uh, We're going to be discussing what I've called it this morning is Leviathan and the Children of Pride. Y'all ready? I'm going to clean these off here. Leviathan and the Children of Pride. This is very important. Pride creeps in on us many ways, but it's a destructive force. And I got a lot of scriptures we're going to go to today. First one I want you to go to, first of all, let's just go to Job chapter 41. We'll turn there, Job chapter 41. I'll get there myself in just a second. Now, in Job chapter 41, it's also mentioned in the book of Isaiah. You'll see this term in the Hebrew, this term Leviathan. Leviathan, defined in the Hebrew language, I'll just give you the definition here. This is from the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. It is a wreath animal that is a serpent, especially the crocodile or some other large sea monster. Figuratively, it is the constellation of the dragon, also a symbol of Babylon. So this Leviathan creature that God is talking about, he gives the definition that it is like a serpent uh, that has wings. Many people don't understand like the, the angels of God. Many of them we have, the Bible talks about there's different kinds of angels, seraphim, cherubim, um, there's different kinds, ministers of fire, flames of fire. They're called, they're, they're different things, and they look different. And what the term seraphim means, a lot of people don't know that it means literally flying serpent or flame. Um, so some of the, fa- you've got to remember some of the angels that fell are these different kinds of angels, cherubims, seraphim. The, the ministering spirits that are flames of fire. You know, people, I saw this the other day, I was watching, and I, and I watch these shows sometimes just to see what's going on, but Ancient Aliens, I keep up with that one because that's the clear Illuminati agenda there. But they were talking about going, pe- different people going to these places where spiritual or paranormal activity is going on, and they're always seeing these, these orbs of light you know, come down and descend, and some of them come down and make these crop circles, you know, and I know some of the crop circles are are hoaxes, but others are not. They're made by supernatural forces. Well, we know that those forces are fallen angels and demons doing those things, but these people will see these orbs of light. Not too long ago, someone posted on Facebook a video of this little, like, flame, looked like it was moving around in the clouds, playing a little hide-and-seek game, it was, it was a wild little thing that somebody sent me. I was like, 
You know, the Bible says Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, but some of the fallen angels that went with him are literally called flames of fire. So there will be these orbs of light. Um, but this Leviathan creature really is a symbol or represents just another term, I believe, for Satan or Lucifer or his original name in Hebrew, Hallel, but the fallen angel, Satan, Lucifer. Now, when he describes this dragon, serpent, sea monster creature to Job, he's telling Job, he said, can you, basically, can you control him? Can you deal with him? Can you kill him? And, of course, Job never says anything because he knows he can't. And I'm just going to say this today. This is not part of, really, this is not important one way or the other, but I'm just going to share with you that I believe that this creature really existed, was real, and was a representation, or physical representation on the earth, of Satan. Just like when Jesus came, Jesus was the physical manifestation of God upon the earth. So I believe this creature was real because God describes it as real, as a dragon that breathed fire, that had scales. Um, a lot of the things that are in the movies and the books and things that we think are myths really are not myths. And, you know, they found skeletons of these creatures, and there's one huge one, and God does say that he slayed this Leviathan. But then he talks about this Leviathan, and we're going to read it it's in the last part of this chapter, because I don't want to read the whole chapter, you can read it later, of all the descriptions of Leviathan. But he makes this statement in the end about this Leviathan, which is interesting, which lets you know he was more than just a physical creature, that he represented the spiritual, also the spiritual creature, I believe, Satan, the dragon. And he says this, Let's go down to the last verse. It says he, verse 34, He beholdeth all high things. He is the king over all the children of pride. You see that? He is the king over all the children of pride. So we know that even though he's talking about, I believe, a, a creature that really existed, but the symbology here, or the, the symbols represent Satan as the king or the ruler or the commander over all the children who let pride rule their life. And we've got to think about something, and, and we've got to remember this. Satan did not get kicked out of heaven because of sexual sin or drunkenness or, you know, partying. He got kicked out of heaven over pride. And can I just tell you something? Pride, the sin of pride, can determine heaven or hell for a lot of people. And there are a lot of people, I mean, the unsaved are automatically in pride. They can't help but be that way. They have no alternative. The world revolves around them, their lives, it's all about self. But the problem with this is not just that pride is in the lost, the unsaved, in the worldly, the ones who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's the pride that's in the Christians that's really bad. And boy, is there ever pride. But I want to tell you this. If the sin of pride dominates your life, then Leviathan is your Lord and Jesus is not. He is the king over all the children of pride. Let's look at, go to Ezekiel 28. I want to bring out some of the stuff here about Lucifer's fall. And I hope you all are going to stay with me because I'm not going to get in a hurry this morning. This is so very important. This is one of those Examine your heart messages. you got to hate pride with a passion. And as you're turning there, I want to say this about pride. 
A lot of times people, and I'm talking about Christian people, who are bold and confident get mistakenly or falsely accused of being prideful. When a lot of times it's the complete opposite. If somebody is bold and they're confident that they're speaking the truth of the Word of God and you think they're just too brash, they're just too you know, straightforward or plain spoken or blunt or whatever you want to call it, if you, sometimes we, we accuse people of that, of being in pride, and especially as Christians we accuse one another of being in pride, especially when we're in a debate or we're in a doctrinal discussion over, over what is truth in a situation or an, over an issue. And one of the first things that comes out, if you're bold and strong and outspoken, oh, you're in pride. Somehow the church world's got an idea that being weak and, and uh, lukewarm and uh, indecisive and uh, trying to play politics and be on both sides of the fence at the same time and stuff like, oh, well, we're, we're both right. No, you're not. But sometimes the most prideful people are the ones who look like they're the most meek and mild and gentle people. Pride is a deceptive thing. I know a lot of people that are in pride over their humility. They are really convinced that they're humble because they're sweet and they don't offend anybody. They don't hurt anybody's feelings. They don't want to hurt the poor homosexuals' feelings, so we don't tell them it's sin. We don't tell them the truth that it will damn them to hell if they don't get out of it. Now that's believed to be humility now. Tolerance. But it's just the opposite. Can you say this? Most of the time, whatever the world thinks is good, God's kingdom is the complete opposite. I mean, think about it. If the unsaved who are under the control of Leviathan, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, if it's good to them, probably not biblical. 99 times out of 100. Let's look at this. What did I tell you to turn to? Ezekiel 28. Speaking of... Satan's fall, look what he says here, verse 12, that son of man take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and saith unto him, or say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the psalm, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of, thy, workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were, was prepared in thee in the day that I was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled, thee with, in the, midst, filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee down to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. Now, I could keep reading here, but I wanted you to see that this, he, he says, take up this lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, but he wasn't talking about the king of Tyrus. The king of Tyrus was a man. But Satan, Lucifer, the fallen angel, was working through him, was, the, was using him, was, I guess you could say, possessing him and using him. And that's why God said, speak to him, because the king of Tyrus had not been in Eden, the garden of God. No, there were only four beings that were ever in Eden. Adam and Eve, God himself, and the serpent, Lucifer, the dragon. So he's speaking to him, and he says, I'm going to cast you out of here. You were perfect. I made you perfect, beautiful. You have built-in pipes and tabrets to make music. He was the worship leader. 
God gave him great wisdom and great beauty and a great anointing. This is Christians. Uh-oh. Sound familiar? When we come to Jesus and, and we confess Him as Lord and Savior, we repent, we're washed in the blood, we become beautiful to God. That's called the beauty of holiness. We're, we're beautiful to Him. He anoints us with fresh oil. He anoints us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us gifts. But see, just like Lucifer, we can blow it all, we can lose it all, we can be cast out if we let pride come in. And what was the pride? He, he says he was lifted up. You know what this term lifted up means? This is the term lifted up. It's pronounced, the Hebrew word is gaba. And it means to soar, to be lofty, to be haughty, to exalt self, to be proud of self. And it says because of his anointing, because of his wisdom that God gave everything, matter of fact, everything that was what God gave him, wisdom, beauty, anointing, special gifts and talents, a position of leadership. But he began to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Now, the book of Isaiah tells us further what was in Lucifer, Halal, the dragon, what was in his mind before he fell. Go to Isaiah 14. Now, I know I've read these verses before. But how many of you can say that you've learned all this stuff the first time I taught it to you? All right? Isaiah chapter 14, everybody there? I want you to get there because I want you to see it. Verse 12, he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, which should be translated Halal, the fallen angel Halal, which is Lucifer, Satan. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And God says, no, you will not do any of those things. You will be brought down to the sides of the pit, which is hell. You will be brought down to hell. And they that see thee shall narrowly look upon you and consider thee, saying, is this the man that did make the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms? And that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners. So he says here about Lucifer, son of the morning, Halal, the fallen angel. He says, you've said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. How many Christians say, I'm going to heaven? While they live in disobedience and rebellion and sin to God, but they say, I'm going to heaven. While they believe lies and teach lies. That, that idea, oh, because I believed in Jesus and I was baptized when I was nine years old, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter if I'm a fornicator. It doesn't matter if I'm an adulterer. It doesn't matter if I'm a homosexual. It doesn't matter if I'm an idolater. It doesn't matter if I'm in pride and think I'm wonderful. I'm going to heaven. Isn't that what Satan just said? I'm hurting somebody's feelings today. I don't care. He says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. See, part of our problem as Christians, what gets us in trouble, is we can never be satisfied with what God has given us. We never find an ability to be content with what we have. God has blessed us. Man, if He's blessed you with with money or with clothes or with a home or with a family. I mean, a lot of people don't have those things. I mean, you, you, what I'm saying is, we, Paul said it. He said in Philippians, we must learn that whatever state we're in to be content. But see, part of our problem, when we, pride says, I'm going to exalt my throne, my place, my, what God's given me, I'm going to push it higher myself. This is where self, a lot of self-promotion and ambition, and, and, you don't, and, and let me just tell you, you don't think that's in the church world, particularly in the West. 
better open your eyes. Oh, they always say it's about winning souls and that the church growing by winning souls. No, it's usually not about that. For the pastor, it's usually about having a big church and so he can be looked at as successful. But I'm telling you, so it's, it, it's, it's rampant in the church, not only, not only in the pulpit, but in the pew or the chair, whatever you want to say, this, this idea that I have got to make myself more than I am. I've got to make myself to be something that God has not really called me to be or not saying for me to do. And then I see people, I've watched it for years, push themselves into trying to be an elder, trying to be a board member, trying to be a Sunday school teacher. When God, when God was just saying, wait, learn, grow. Right? Like Kermit said, learn to hear God's voice about sin before you hear him about the fivefold ministry. Right? Learn to hear him about your own dealing with your own problems before you're going to try to go help somebody else out of their problems. Right? Listen, one of the things in the kingdom of God I can tell you right now, I get invited all over the world. I, India, Pakistan. All over the place. I get invitations all over the place. I, you know, I have an open standing invitation to Nigeria to rent a stadium and it will be filled at any time that I want to go. And I could go over there and fill a stadium of 60,000 people and preach and take pictures and video and come back and put up a big website and look like a big man. But you know why I don't do that? Because I'm not doing stuff to be seen. I want to do only what God says for me to do. Look, I know a bunch of guys. You know Todd Bentley? The guy Todd Bentley that ended up the Lakeland revival, healing revival? That while he was doing the revival, he was having an affair with his assistant and then left his wife, divorced his wife and left his wife and kids for this other woman. You know that's you know that's how he got popular? Went to Africa, got big crowds, took a bunch of pictures and videos, come back over here and built himself up to be something. I'll exalt my throne. Newsflash, not your throne, not my throne. It's not I'm going to push what I have up here. A lot of people wonder why I don't do certain things. It's all down to this. I had a guy getting upset with me the other day on Facebook through messaging because I told him I'm not going to Pakistan right now. I mean, this guy started getting pushy and tried to throw out, well, the the Bible says you're supposed to go into all the world. Really? So I've been all over the world. I've obeyed that command. I said, until God tells me to go to Pakistan, I don't go to Pakistan. I don't know, how do I even know, I don't even know if, if he's a Muslim trying to set me up. You get what I'm saying? Our job as Christians, you want, to, you want to know the secret to humility? Obey God's written word and wait on his voice to lead. If you will not do those things, you will never be humble. There is no personal agenda you can have. See, that's why it took so long before I started another church. I wasn't just going to do it just because I know how to do it or because I know I'm called to do it. You have to wait for God's direction in your life. Let's keep reading this. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So the devil had this agenda, right? 
Now, let me say the other part of this. You are always operating in pride when God's Word says one thing and you choose to do something else. You hear me? Disobedience to God's written Word, disobedience to the Holy Spirit speaking and leading in your life, disobedience to that is a manifestation of pride. Because what you're saying is just like Satan said here before he fell, I know better. God, I know you put me here. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is my realm of authority. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I know better. I need to exalt my throne. I need to ascend above the heights of the cloud. I need to go to the congregation of the north. I have this agenda. I know better than you. Let me tell you one of my, one of my most favorite verses in the, in the Proverbs here. And this is Proverbs, and I'm, I'm really skipping over here. In my notes, but it's in Proverbs 21, verse 30. You want, you, want, you want a good verse to memorize. Memorize this one. Proverbs 21, 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. I don't care how smart you think you are. doesn't matter how smart you think you are or how much wisdom you think you have or how much education you think you have or how much Greek or Hebrew you think you have. If, if anything goes against the Lord's Word, the Bible, I don't care what you call it. It is not counsel. It is not understanding. It is not wisdom. It is pride. It is pride saying, I know how to do it better. Do you hear what I'm saying? No counsel, no wisdom, no understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. And you know, this is what amazes me. See, there are people, even Christians now, who are doubting the Bible as the inspired Word of God. Many Christians reading stuff like Donald Miller, Blue Like Jazz, reading stuff like, you know, The Velvet Elvis by uh, Rob Bell or Love Wins or all these twisted things, The Shack, all of this deception that clearly teaches things that are not biblical and that you really get to pick and choose out of the scriptures what you want to believe. But here's the thing that blows my mind. I mean, I, I have this person, I get emails from people all over, all over the country, all over the world. I've shared that many times. But I get these emails, and I, get, I have one recently of a, a, a young lady who's married, and her husband says he's a Christian, but lives in sin. Lives in sin and rebellion to God's commandments says he doesn't believe all of the scriptures are inspired by the Lord. That he believes that the Bible and the Koran and, you know, other, like the Hindu, he believes they all are just, you know, written by men and just, just the writings of men, religion. But he still calls himself a Christian. And you know what's, what's, what's absolutely funny is, is that the information is, is available to anyone who's willing to research and study and spend a little time, but the Bible is not like the Koran. The Bible is completely different than the Koran or the Hindu Vedas or Nostradamus or all, any of these other false prophets and false teachers and false religions that's out there. The Bible is very unique. It has been proven by manuscript evidence. I mean, there's more manuscript evidence going back for the Bible than any other book in ancient history. We know that these words were written when the Bible says they were written. We know that it's supernatural because the scientific knowledge that's in it is true and accurate 
far beyond or far before we could ever we ever had the instruments or the technology to find it out. And I've shared some of those things with you in the series Science in the Bible, and there's much more. I'm going to do some more on that. And then when you just take the sheer magnitude of very specific Bible prophecies, some thousands of years old, some hundreds of years old, how many of them, we're talking about hundreds upon hundreds, very specific things that have come to pass, even when you get into the laws of mathematics and compound probabilities. Mathematically, this book right here proves that it is of supernatural origin of the true Creator God. So what I'm saying is, archaeology proves it, science proves it, Manuscript evidence proves it. Fulfilled prophecy proves it. Far beyond anything that the Koran or the Hindu Vedas or the writings of the Buddhas or Nostradamus or anybody else, it's far beyond it. The evidence is there. There is enough evidence to where it's not blind faith. I, I don't just believe the Bible because I have some kind of blind faith. I believe the Bible because I've researched the evidence that proves not only it's correct and true and accurate, but that it is of supernatural divine origin. So to sit back in a smug way as a Christian, or calling yourself a Christian, and go, well, you know, it was written by men, and, you know, there's some mistakes. I don't know if I believe it all. But you know that stuff about love? is Loving everybody. That's good. I'll take that. I don't, I don't know about that hell business. I don't know about that sin stuff. You know, I don't know. Isn't it amazing? How do they know which part to take and which part to reject? How do they know? Who's their authority? Hmm? No, there's no other book like it. God revealed things about the ancient world, creation, the stuff going on before Adam and Eve. Well, I was watching the other day, somebody sent me a video, and I, and I can't remember where the video was from, but I don't know if it was space.com or NASA or who, I don't remember, but describing how planets are formed, right? And they watching how new planets are being formed in a, in a different galaxies and solar systems, and it follows the exact pattern of Genesis 1. The so earth was without form, void, darkness. And they talk about how planets are in this big cloud as they spin around the star and as they begin to clump together with other parts and they come in, it says, and they eventually come out of that cloud of darkness as it, as the, the gravity forces stuff away and forces the earth or forces the new planet closer to the star. And it's like amazing without form, void, in the darkness. So the more science finds out, the more they find out that our book is correct. The Bible, Genesis, through Malachi, Matthew to Revelation, not the Koran. I mean, come on, folks. The Koran says, and I'm just going to be blunt with you, the Koran says that a man's semen comes from his liver. Wrong. I think we know now. You want to follow that kind of foolishness? I mean, I'm not joking. I've been reading the Koran. Some stupid stuff. But you know why Muhammad wrote it? Because that was the popular idea of medicine of the day in 600 A.D. So he didn't have divine inspiration about how man is made. But God did because he told us where it came from. Right? I hate to be so blunt, but folks, you'll remember this sermon because of that, won't you? <laughs> You get what I'm saying? The evidence is there. But you have people... See, and this is why the Scripture... I'm going to give you another one. Here's, here's the Scripture, Psalm 14, verse 1. Mike, you ought to know this one. 
Psalm 14, verse 1. This is why the Bible says this. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. The fool. God has revealed himself to mankind. I mean, I was thinking about it this morning when I was getting ready. God revealed himself within the smallest particle that makes up what we are and everything that we see that's created. I mean, when you take the three basic elements of an atom, proton, neutron, electron, you have the picture of the Trinity. An atom cannot be without those three things, those three parts. So all physical matter is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons bound together, working together. And it's interesting. Proton, neutron, electron, the power, flowing around. Kind of gives you the picture of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And the very basic element, the creation of everything, God writes His signature. Three makes one. Science science, and the Bible, there's never a contradiction. Oh, but there's some people say, now, well, certain scientists say, you know, teach evolution. Oh, oh my goodness. A scientist has never lied about anything, have they? A scientist has never been wrong about anything, have they? They lie all the time. They're getting paid to lie about vaccines. They're getting paid to lie about climate change and global warming. They're getting paid to lie about all kinds of things. But there's some out there that are willing to tell the truth, that are just study what's going on in the world, what's going on in the universe, things in the earth, and just tell you, this is how it works. Here's how it works. And I love it when a scientist will say, we don't know. Still trying to figure it out. Instead of making up crap. Like Piltdown Man, off of the tooth of an extinct pig. That whole false theory and lie was built off the tooth of an extinct pig. It took years before we could test DNA and find out, no, it's not even human, it's a pig. But they built a whole, you know, man as part of the process of evolution. Just made the whole story up. That's why there is no counsel, or wisdom, or understanding. His word, the Bible, is correct, is true. And every, and I love what Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Now hear, hear what I'm about to tell you. If you don't like part of it, you're in pride. If you don't want to hear part of it, if you want to try to make excuses for part of it, if you want to try to explain part of it away, if you want to deny it, if you want to reject it, if you want to disobey part of it, you are a part of the children of pride. Because the humble will say, God is true and every man a liar. God's word is true whether I like it or not. The parts that are nice and sweet and the parts that are hard and difficult. Somebody say amen. Amen or oh me. Let me give you a simple, I wrote this down this morning, simple definition. Simple definition of pride is that you think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And your own ideas and opinions and thoughts and desires come before God's Word, His truth, the facts of history, archaeology, science, and, and the wisdom of His commands. Pride is simply doing things your own way instead of God's way. It is believing your own ideas instead of God's Word. It is a manifestation of stubbornness and the worship of self. And pride ends in destruction and hell.
You don't believe me about that? Let me let me read that. That's my de- definition this morning. Oh, it's not complete. I go ahead and tell you, there's much more to it than just this. But a simple definition of pride is what I said is that you think of yourself more highly than you ought. Your own ideas, opinions, thoughts, and desires come before God's word, his truth, the facts of history, archaeology, science, fulfilled prophecy. Your own ideas and your own desires come before the wisdom of his commands. Pride is simply doing things your own way instead of God's way. It is believing your own ideas instead of God's word. It is a manifestation of stubbornness and self-worship. Let me just tell you right now, if you resist God's commands, you don't worship him, you worship yourself. How do I know this? This stubbornness. And see, I'm going to tell you something. This morning when I was praying over this and what to preach, God inspired this this morning because I saw some of your faces. And he said, children of pride, stubborn. And then this verse came to me, very familiar to many people, 1 Samuel 15, 23. And who was this talking about? The context of this passage is the King Saul, who had been anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the Holy Spirit turned his heart into another, gave him the heart of another man, and he prophesied. So he had the anointing, he had the gifts, he was, he was saved. It's a picture of being saved. He was given a new heart. He was given the Holy Spirit. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. But Saul wouldn't obey. Saul wouldn't obey the commands of God through the prophet. He wouldn't obey fully. He would partially obey sometimes. And he was more worried about what people, the the outward appearance than he was with obeying God. And what did Samuel say to him? Saul, you know, he told Saul to kill all the animals that they had captured. And Saul instead disobeyed and he saved them and he sacrificed them to the Lord. And then he said this, this is what he said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. But Saul could say, well, no, 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 I did, I did, did part of it. And he did. He, said, he tried to go on and say, I, no, 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 I obeyed the Lord. No, you, you halfway did it. You halfway did it. But look at what this is. We all remember this part. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. But we forget this one. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness is idolatry, but it is the idolatry of self. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. Nobody's going to tell me how to do it, not even the Lord. And if I want to do half of it, I'll do half of it. And then I'll sacrifice, I'll go to church and give offerings or go to church and, or, or try to be a good person. And you're just walking in pride. And here's what happens to the pride. He says he rejected Saul was rejected by the Lord. Oh, but wait a minute, Pastor. Now I'm once saved, always saved, no matter what. You better start believing the Word of God and not these lying devils and not these lying preachers and not these lying churches. Because when you stand before God on the day of judgment, you're going to give an account of what you did or did not do with this book. Proverbs 21, 2. Every way of man is right in his own eye, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Every way of man. But let me just say, every way of stubborn, prideful man. But see, you know what? The man or the woman who does this, Lord, I've tried it my way. And it hadn't worked out. I did it my way, and I understand now that my way was sin. I did it my way. But Lord, from this point on, forgive me for that. I'm going to do it your way. That's humility. 
And there are some people who have submitted to Jesus as Lord truly, not just out of their mouth. And they've submitted to Jesus' lordship, and that is humility. You want, you want a simple definition? Pride is disobedience to God. And humility is obedience. Pride is making excuses, well, I'm not that bad. Humility says, no, I'm a wretched sinner. God, forgive me. Help me. Pride says, well, my righteousness and my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. But humility says, oh, I need the blood of Jesus, and I don't deserve the blood of Jesus, and I don't deserve forgiveness. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I will change, Lord. I will repent. I will obey. That's humility. You don't believe me? Let me show you this. Go to Philippians chapter 2. I love this. Philippians 2. I love my, my notes. I followed no order to them this morning. I'm having to flip through the three pages here. Philippians 2, verse 3. We're going to read a few verses here. Stay with me, please, because this point is most important. Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, which is another way to say humility or being humble, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. I mean, don't be selfish and all consumed about everything's about you, but every man on the things of others, meaning... Start thinking more about others than yourself. All right? Then he says this here, Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he says this in verse 12, the very next verse, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In the context, you know, we always quote that verse, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? I mean, some churches do. They, some churches avoid it like the plague because it sounds like you've got to do something, right? But the context here, he's showing you, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you've got to be like Jesus. And Jesus who did not have to come here, did not have to take on the form of a man that would have to sweat and suffer and be beaten and spit upon. He knew what was coming, but God Almighty took upon himself the form of a man. Now listen to this. And it says, he humbled himself and became obedient. There is no humility. Back up to that. He humbled himself and became obedient. So to all of you, here, whether you're here, whether you're listening, if you will not obey God's command in His written word and when He speaks, you will not obey and submit then you're in pride. And if you're in pride, if you're, if you're resisting him, it's because you're being stubborn. And if you're stubborn, you're an idolater worshiping yourself. And if your own ideas and your own opinions and your own plans come before what God wants for your life and what God's written in his word, then you are following Leviathan. Leviathan, the serpent, the dragon. That's your Lord because that's what he does. That's, that's who he is. 
You say, well, Pastor Dean, I don't drink. I don't smoke dope. I don't sleep around outside of marriage. I'm not a homosexual. But are you a rebel? There's a lot of Christian rebels. I don't like going to church. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. You know what I call Christian snot. You're either going to be in the pride camp or you're going to be in the humble camp. You hear me? You can say I'm a Christian all day long. But if you're in the pride camp, here's what happens to the pride camp. Let me give you a few more. Let me just give you a hint. It ain't good. Here's what God says about the proud. Isaiah 13, verse 9. And this is end time context. You especially don't want to be in the proud camp in the end. Let me tell you why. Here's what he says. Proverbs, uh, Isaiah 13, 9. I'm going to let you turn it. Isaiah 13, 9. This is an end time passage for sure. Listen to what he says. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. That's exactly what Matthew 24 says. He says, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. Oh. Let me just tell you, everyone who's mocking God right now, everyone who's resisting God right now, everyone who's in pride and stubbornness and doing it their own way and angry at God or whatever about anything, let me tell you, he says the day is coming that he will cause all the arrogancy of the proud to cease. It will be over with. There are a lot of people that have money that are so prideful about the fact that they have money and others don't. All that's about to be ripped away. Here's the thing. The Bible says this. The book of James, he says, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The word resist means to fight against. God will fight against the proud and the stubborn. He's not blessing you. If you're you're prideful and disobedient and stubborn, He is not blessing you. You will receive judgment. You will receive chastisement and correction. He will bring the pain. Trying to get you to turn around, trying to get you to stop before this day when he's going to cause it all to cease by absolute wrath and force. He says he will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So the pride are going to be dealt with. Look at Malachi 4.1. Another end time prophetic verse or passage. He says this, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And notice who he speaks of first. All the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you, he says, that fear my name shall the son of righteousness. And and the reason they use the term son here, the only reason they use that is because in the Hebrew, all it means is the brilliant glory or light coming from the east. That's that's a direct reference to Jesus said he will the, everything will go dark, and then when he comes, the, the it will be brighter than the lightning coming out of the east. That's what that word means. He says the Son of Righteousness will arise, that this brilliant glory of of Jesus will come out of the east. And he says, for those that fear my name, those that tremble, those that are humble, 
those that go, I believe God means what He says about sin, pride. He goes on to say, and you shall tread down, verse 3, you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. The proud will be brought down. Proverbs chapter 1, he says, the Lord, seven things the Lord hates. First thing he says, a proud look, lying tongue, feet that are quick to run to evil and mischief, those who sow discord among the brethren. But a proud look is first on the list. Let me just end with this. Isaiah 27.1 The day is coming. It says this, In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, what is he talking about, the dragon that's in the sea? What is he talking about in that day? In that day, he's talking about the end time. Remember the Bible, Revelation 13 says, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. That's the coming world government. That's the coming mark of the beast. That's the coming, all these things that are coming. And he says here, when Jesus comes, the sword is going to come out of his mouth and destroy this beast, this serpent that's come out of the sea. But who follows the serpent. This Leviathan, who follows it? The children of pride. The God God has said in his word, do not take this mark when it comes. Oh, and it's coming quick. Real fast. Do not do this. See, the word of God says one thing. How many how many people are going to do the uh, the opposite? You know, the Pope's coming. How many Christians are going to go, Oh, Holy Father. Oh, the Pope's wonderful. He's a blasphemer. He's an idolater. He's a blasphemer. He's the false prophet. But there's going to be Christians fawning over him, Christians meeting him. And I'm not talking about just Roman Catholics. I'm talking about Protestants and Evangelicals and, and, and Pentecostals are going to be basically worshiping this man as he comes to America, they're, they're going to be slobbering. Man worship. See, see, let me tell you something. You say, I won't worship the Antichrist. I won't worship the false prophet. I won't worship a man. Yes, you will. If you won't obey God and you're going to be stubborn and prideful and disobedient and do what you want, you're already worshiping yourself, one human being. What's the difference of adding another one? You'll do it. What if they tell you, take this chip in your hand or your forehead and we'll immediately deposit in your bank account $5 million because we're going to disperse the wealth of the world to everyone who will submit to the new world order, the new system. $5 million or $10 million. Or, or we'll just make sure that your chip never runs out of money, whatever money they use or whatever they call it. If you'll just submit Pledge allegiance to this new system. If you'll just take this chip so we can keep an eye on you and make sure you're not doing anything wrong and you're with us, you'll have plenty of food, you'll have plenty of water, you, you'll be taken care of, you won't be shipped off to a prison camp or killed. How many Christians who already worship self and, and even worship their families more than God are going to say, yeah, God understands. Or you know what? I, that book was written by men. I'm not, even though he warned you that it was coming, 
that no man may buy or sell unless he takes the mark of the beast in the hand of the forehead. God's warned us for 2,000 years. Oh, but no, but that, no, I'm a, God, God will understand. No, you're a rebel. You're in pride. You're trying to save yourself. And what did Jesus say? If you try to save yourself in this world, you will lose your soul. But if you're willing to lose your life for Him in this world, you will gain all eternity. You will gain heaven. But we got Christians who won't give up. Fornication, adultery, pornography, alcohol. I want to be a Christian, I want to go to heaven, but I'm not willing to lose my life for Jesus. I'm really not willing to love Jesus with all my heart. I want to get a I want to get a Jesus vaccine, just enough to make me immune to going to hell. Well, let me just give you a hint: that doesn't exist. There's no Jesus inoculation. I got a little bit. Now I'm immune from going to hell or being deceived. I mean, there's a lot of Christians that think, oh, because I believe in Jesus or I pray that prayer. They think they're immune to everything. They think the devil can't touch them. They think that they're going to heaven no matter how much they sin or in pride or rebellion or lust or whatever. They, I mean, there's, there's such a deception upon the church world. They are the children of pride. And let me just say this. If the Bible says one thing about a doctrinal issue and you say something else, you're in pride. I don't care how many theological degrees are hanging on the wall. If the Bible says you can fall away from God as a Christian and be lost, and it does in multiple places, and you say, no, it can't, you're a false teacher. You're a false prophet. I mean, a lot of people as a pastor, Dean, you're just too, you're too intense. You're intimidating. Your bald head scares me. I'm picking on somebody specifically. But the same person that says, oh, I scare him, I'm all head, my goatee. Scare they're taken up for homosexuals. They think they're once saved, always saved, no matter how they live. See what I'm saying? I hope I'm scary. I hope I'm scary. Because you know what? One day, and make it to heaven if I have scared you enough, scared the hell out of you and the sin out of you and the pride out of you and made you run to Jesus and we're in heaven for all eternity together, I promise you, I won't be scary anymore. You'll come up and you'll thank me. You'll go, thank you, Pastor Dean, for telling me the truth. Thank you, Pastor Dean, for talking to me when you knew I hated your guts or I was scared of you or I didn't agree with you or I thought you were too strong or too this or too that. I'm going to end with this right here. This is it, I promise. I haven't said that. Okay. You know, I appreciate when people tell me, Pastor Dean, we appreciate that you, you know, we just love what you preach. I mean, I get these emails. It's wonderful. I used to not get any of them. So it's it's nice. But let me say that um, I thought about this this morning. And I thought about, you know, it's sad when I got to hear from Christians all over the country and even in different countries. I said, oh, Pastor Dean, we just, so, we just so love your messages. We so love your preaching. We so love the tr- that you're willing to preach the truth. What gets me is what the Lord shared with me this morning. It was like, you ain't doing anything special for us. You're doing what is your duty to do. You're just doing what you ought to do. And I thought, how sad that we are so surrounded by false prophets, false teachers, and weak, need Christians who won't speak the truth, the pastors and ministers, that, that the sheep out here are so starving for the truth Many are 
that they think you're something special if you just do what God says to do. You're not special. I'm not special. I just am willing to do what God says to do and to teach and preach what God says to preach and to not be ashamed of it and not be fearful of it and not worry about what you think or anybody else thinks. But I sit back and I go, wow, what? we are in a very, we're, we're in the apostasy. We're in the falling away. For it to be odd for a preacher to tell the truth that he's somehow special if he just does his, his job. It's weird. And I, I'll tell you, many mornings, many Tuesday nights, many Friday nights when we do Friday nights, you know what I tell you? I am exhausted. I stand weak, physically weak sometimes, spiritually weak sometimes. This morning, I can tell you physically, mentally, and emotionally, I did not want to come to church. I've been to Nashville driving and back. I've been to Georgia and back. I've been, it's been, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I could have laid down on the concrete floor and went to sleep. And I feel, sometimes I feel so inadequate and so weak. And am I hearing correctly? Am I preaching what I'm supposed to preach this morning? Lord, did I put enough time in? Did I put enough prayer in? Did I do this and that? Did I do this and that? So I agree with what Paul. I know what Paul meant when he was talking to the Corinthians. He said, my preaching, and he said, my preaching and teaching, he said, I'm with you, in front of you, in weakness and fear and much trembling. I sit back sometimes and wonder, am I, am I actually doing anything? Is it this? Anyway, you understand what I'm saying. I don't think I'm special. I know I struggle with temptation and with attacks and with discouragement and with all these things as much as you guys do. There's no difference. We're all human. We're all the same. But the choices we make, are we going to believe God? Are we going to believe God's Word? Are we going to obey God? Are we going to humble ourselves and admit when we're wrong and when we're in sin or when we're in pride? Are we going to be humble and obey Jesus? walk in the light and be cleansed by his blood, are we going to be prideful? And you know what's so, what's so sad is, at any time, you can choose to change. Meaning, if you're being humble and obedient, you can decide to be prideful and disobedient. If you're being prideful and disobedient, you can decide to be humble and obedient. That's what makes church so fun. As you constantly got people good doing this in and out. <laughs> All right, Lord, let, if we could just get everybody in the same camp and moving in the same direction. Sometimes, every now and then, there's a brief moment, I guess, when they crisscross and we go, oh, we're there for a minute. Now we're not. Oh, they we're there for a minute. Now we're not. Be sure of this. Pastor Dean may make you angry sometimes. I may offend you sometimes. I may make you uncomfortable sometimes. You might not like me sometimes. But one thing I promise you, in my heart, deep in my heart, I only want you to be blessed in this world and make it to heaven when you die or when Jesus comes. That's my desire. And I know that only the truth, you will either submit to that or you won't. There's no magic bullet. I told some parents in here, there's no silver bullet to make your children do right. If there was, I'd be shooting them with them. All right? But the seeds of truth, let me tell you something, the seeds of truth watered by prayer. That's all you can do. Truth, 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 prayer, prayer, prayer. And after we, we get off the air, I will share something with you guys. That's a good thing. But let's pray.
and you can go ahead and say bye to our radio audience. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us clarity, it gives us warning, it gives us ability to see ourselves where we are, where we really are, where we think we are. But you show us, God, where we really are with you, where we're walking. You show us where we need to change. And Lord, like David's prayer, we say, Lord, search our hearts and try our hearts and see if there's any wicked way in us. Lord, reveal any pride, any rebellion, any disobedience, any stubbornness. And Lord, help us to be humble and repent. Help us to choose to submit to your Lordship.